when you put Conan, mm -hmm. his infinite curiosity into those cultures, he can see amazing things and the reader can see amazing things through Conan's eyes. Hey, you Stygian dogs. This part three of a conversation with Conan's compatriots, Steve Staffel and Brian D. Anderson may be my favorite in the series. We look at balancing fan expectations and the opportunities that the Hyborian Age gives us in developing Conan as a character. Religion and culture are discussed and we see Steve work with Brian's ideas in real time. And we hear about Steve's documentarian grandparents and their connection to Joseph Campbell's The Power of Myth. And finally, Steve and Brian speak about S.M. Sterling and his Conan novel, Blood of the Serpent. I know you'll enjoy this episode. Also, don't forget to check out Brian D. Anderson's Conan the Child, releasing December 26th from Titan Books. It goes back to what I was saying earlier. Today, you have people who want things to be exactly the same, but they want them to be different. But they want them to be the same. So they don't really want the material to evolve. And if you evolve and they don't agree with you, then you'll end up with a huge pushback that will quite mm -hmm. conceivably um, harpoon the attempt to do something new. Well, you know, I mean, you do you remember when I uh, the, the the sample chapters that I wrote and sent you? Um, I don't. I don't. I, I can't call them up the way you can. No, no. Well, no, no. I'm. I, um. I'm right now. I'm, I, I don't know if Titan's going to do it or not, but I'm pitching an idea for a novel with them that right. takes Conan that takes Conan for from, you know, can we all, we all Howard wrote about Conan's uh, the, um, when he leaving um, Samaria was that he had wanderlust. That's right. really all. That's all he says about it. He doesn't go into the events that led up to it. And I came up with what I thought is a great, you know, series of events that lead up, to him finally leaving Samaria. But right. I'm also painfully aware that no matter if I stick the landing or not, this is going to cause a shitstorm. I mean, there's going to be people that says, how dare you? And there's going to be people that say, say finally. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're, you're not going to make everybody happy. We yeah, were talking about that earlier. No but. Way I can make everybody happy, but kind of the advantage just that is because I, I love Conan as a character so much, and it meant so much to my my young fantasy life, and it still means so much to me as a writer. Um, that 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 fight, um, I, I like some, a fight like that to draw attention to, to the uh, to the Hyborian world to to Conan uh, Conan as a character. I mean, I would always. You, you've seen my writing. I, I stay. I, I do my best to stay true to the character Howard came up with. And when I get it wrong, y'all were y'all were quick to tell me, "No, this is The Witcher. This is not Conan." And I, <laughs> well, I also I had a story. I had a story come across my desk that um, included a, a group of, of female characters, and. My comment to uh, the author was that I thought that the female characters were underdone. And uh, he did some rewriting that I think corrected that. However, mm -hmm. one of his comments to me was that I forgot about the misogyny that was inherent to, to Howard's work. And my comment to him was, I did not forget the misogyny. I disagreed with the misogyny. And because it wouldn't be a change to the nature of Conan, mm -hmm. you can have a much more interesting, three-dimensional, in-depth group of characters around him. The two things about the Hyborian Age that are, to my mind, the greatest opportunities, I guess three things. One is the ability to move from from place to place and create those places in a way that feels real. Mm -hmm. um, in in his novel, Steve Sterling did the areas that Conan was uh, dealing with uh, while he was involved with Valeria of the Red Brotherhood down in Stygia. Um, he based it on the portions of Africa, the geography of Africa 
that, mm -hmm. that would be real. Mm -hmm. And so both the animals and the geography, well, the, the animals, the geography, and the climate mm -hmm. were very real. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now the thing about um, the, the other, the, the second thing you can do is you can involve peoples who are, are based upon real cultures that have existed in history. Mm -hmm. And those real cultures, which we for many years saw as being very two dimensional because we were reading books that had limited access to those cultures. Uh, those cultures can be really rich and really yeah. in depth and really challenging. And then the third thing that you can deal with is the belief systems inherent to those cultures because yeah. the belief systems in those cultures can lead to magics and politics and um, practices and communities that could, th that when you put Conan, mm -hmm. his infinite curiosity into those cultures, he can see amazing things and the reader can see amazing things through Conan's eyes. Oh yeah, yeah, see that, that's, that, that is one of the fun parts um, that you get when you're a writer that you get to do is sort of like, even though you have this thing in your head, you get to express it to the reader as if they're, because they're seeing it for the first time, especially when you have a character who's never seen it before. Like Conan, first time he go, uh, goes to, I don't know, uh, Lamora or, or wherever. What does Lamora look like and what does it smell like? Um, and you can express and the reader gets to go along with that. Now you talk, you talk, talk about religion. That, that's one of the things I sort of struggled with, because there's only it's like I wanted to put um, the god Loki in there, and I was t uh, I got the um, god Loki, and we edited it out because nobody was sure if Loki was a god that would have been worshipped during the Hyborian age, and I'm like, yeah, if you got, but if you have, uh, you know, set. And the temple is set. There's no reason you can't have Loki, who, who the Asgardians probably would have um, worshipped. He never mentions Loki, but if you're, if, you know, if you're basing a people off the off the Celts and the Vikings, and and it, you, you sort of yeah. have nowhere else to go if you're going to write about these people, some of the shit you're just going to have to make up because Howard didn't. Okay, uh, no, yeah. no. As an, as an editor, I would tell you to take Loki out. Uh -huh. But I would not necessarily take you, take out the trickster god. Yeah. Here's the thing: you've got to keep in mind that 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 uh, Howard's world is a distinct third world. This mm -hmm. is a third world fantasy, and yeah, thereby yeah. I would not have you put Loki in there because Loki is familiar enough in our culture today mm -hmm. that it would be distracting. Well, on the other hand, you have, to you have now, them, maybe analogous to Loki because, um, like in the in the like I said in the novel I'm pitching, I'm using right now. I'm currently using Loki as a place setter because I don't so much need Loki. I need Loki's child, the the the, the dragon, the serpent, and um, so I'm, I, I know I need to put something analogous to that. But I think you know, what I mean, from from my part as a reader, even if it didn't say Loki. Because I because I have some knowledge of that mythology, I'm going. Oh, he's talking about Loki. You want to put something close enough in there? Because I always thought, uh, you know, you I mean, see, I I wouldn't. I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt. I would not want you to do that. You're going to distract yeah. from your story by mm. making it too blatantly Loki. On the mm. other hand, many cultures have tricksters. Yeah. American Native American cultures have tricksters. Um, yeah. There are trickster gods in so many different cultures. There's so many things that you could do with a trickster god and the son of a trickster that if you make it too blatantly like something that's too familiar, you're going to knock your reader immediately right out of your fiction. Well, and I don't see, think that's going to do any good to you. See, but the reason I chose Loki wasn't because he was trickster god. It was because he had a son that was a dragon. Okay, then do a <laughs> god with a son who's a dragon, but don't make it Loki. That's the whole point. Yeah. 
My whole point is that all of these cultures have all of these fantastic gods and mythologies and creatures, and these creatures can have their analogs in the Hyborian age, but don't do it in a way that is so slavishly like our hmm. world that you're going to take your oh, reader yeah. and say, by the way, I'm taking you and I'm just chucking you out here. <laughs> I don't think no, you should do that to your readers. Yeah, the thing, the thing about Howard stuff, some of the some of the gods he does adhere to, and some of them he doesn't. And it's like it's kind of weird. He it's almost this mixed bag of using mythologies that do exist to but, using but, but that's Howard. Keep in mind, mm -hmm. Howard lived in a day when most people did not know about Loki. Howard could have gotten away with using Set because mm -hmm. most people would have no clue who, who Set, Set was. Is. Yeah, and yeah. so, and, and it's interesting. Uh, I, I have a little bit of a perspective here too because my grandparents did uh, documentary films in Asia and in uh, Africa back in the 1930s. Oh wow! And as a result, they were actually filming things that most people had never seen, had never experienced, had no knowledge of, and thereby in their movie Dark Rapture in the Belgian Congo, it's a completely exotic thing. Today, wow. it's on the History Channel every other week. Do you have, you still have the, uh, do you still have those films? I have some of them on tape, yeah. I mean, uh, if you've you ever thought about uploading them for uh, some people to watch, that would be, I would yeah. love to see something like that. Dark Rapture is a great film, so is Wheels Across India. And uh, if you've ever seen the, uh, uh, oh, The Power of Myth, uh, Joseph Campbell, mm -hmm. if you've ever watched The Power of Myth, there's a scene in there where there's a priestess of the snake who is trying to uh, end a drought of having no male children in her village. But yeah, to yeah. Do so, she has to appeal to a serpent god, and that uh, footage was my grandparents' footage. Oh, wow. Joseph Campbell used that in The Power of Myth. That's but amazing. The, but, but the thing is, okay, now, but this takes me back to the fact that to, the fact is that you and I can go on YouTube now and see that. Yeah. No, you got to understand that this is not a hill I would die on. If you told me let's use something else, I would just use something else because it doesn't oh, no, really. But I would. Yeah. I also <laughs> wouldn't just tell you don't let's use. I, I wouldn't just tell you don't use it. I would talk to you and about okay. If you need this kind of a of a of a god, if you need this kind of a character, if you need this kind of a thread, mm. how best can you accomplish that and do three things? Tell your story, mm -hmm. tell a Conan story, mm -hmm. and fit within the Hyborian age. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, yeah, is like there's so many ways that that can be done. And that's one of the things that we can look forward to is the fact is, is the Titan and the uh, Conan licensors have complete control over what's going on. Any I gotta give them credit that they have been completely uh, they've been completely cool to work with. Um, they haven't they haven't uh, the, w when they said that it was sounding more like The Witcher and less like Conan. They weren't talking about my prose. They were talking about my dialogue. Right, that Conan was asking too many questions and not making uh, enough declarative statements. I'm like, okay, that's an easy fix. You know what I mean? <laughs> it is. I mean, I I hope I really hope they don't limit the character to the point that uh, when compared to the narrative, he, he seems two dimensional because no, in my mind, no, no. Conan, Conan has subtle uh, traits. Yeah. Conan has subtle facets and, mm -hmm. and you don't want to suddenly make him not what he is, but you can delve into what he is in ways that give the character a depth that will pull in the reader. I did one thing that, that uh, I'm, this wasn't even um, um, uh, heroic signatures 
that did this. Uh, I have a really good friend and a brilliant writer, Steve Rocky. Uh, I mean, Chris Rocchio. He um, he writes um, space operas. Uh, like I say, if you if you're listening to this and you check it, check him out. But he's also a, a, a hardcore Conan fan. So right. he's one of the people I sent the story off to and said, okay, man, you know, I knew, you know, I knew I could trust him with the story that he would, you know, and I knew he would give me his honest opinion. He wouldn't, he'd tell me what I needed to hear, not what I wanted to hear. So, good um, friend. <laughs> so he sends it back to me and he was, I, I, there was a part in the story and I'm not going to give any kind of spoilers where Conan was basically willing to be deceptive. And he goes, Conan's not, a, he won't, he wouldn't do this. He would not lie. He would face the music no matter what. And, okay. and I'm thinking, and I'm thinking back on the stories and I'm like, he's right. So I, I changed an aspect of the story. Um, actually, I changed, uh, almost, it really changed the ending to the story as much as anything else. Um, then changed, it, it wasn't such a fundamental change. It was a different story, but it changed the direction of the ending and I said it, he was a hundred percent right. So I mean, those kind of perspectives, especially with the hardcore fans, got to love them for that. They know this character. They know yeah. what Conan wouldn't do. They know he would not. Conan would not do that. He would not stab a man in the back. He would not. You know, he would not do this. He would not do that. And as somebody who is privileged um, to be now a part of that world. Is I felt it incumbent upon me is why I sent it to Chris, why I sent it to a couple other people too. Uh, but before I sent it, uh, sent, before I sent it to you, was I got their perspective on it to make sure I was staying true to who Conan was, who Howard wanted Conan to be. Right. Now, I don't. Write, right. I don't. I don't write like Howard. I might, but. You guys didn't want me to do that. Y'all didn't want me to write uh, in his style. Y'all wanted me to write in my own voice, which th that was, right. uh, I was very happy because it would have taken me a long time to sit there and listen over and over again to uh, to Howard's prose in order to emulate it. Um, and, and that's going to give the, the heroic signatures and the Titan editors the opportunity to do new things that are going to um, excite people because they're not just reading the same old. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, I mean, Steve now, uh, Steve Sterling, <laughs> his, his fantasy, you ever read his, his science fiction? Um, i not. No. It, well, his science fiction and his other stuff reads nothing like his fantasy. I'm like, he writes such, i like, people go, well, he wrote, we were talking about what is and is not a pastiche. And I'm like, um, to me, a pastiche, uh, what I learned a pastiche to be was something that you're writing in the style of, you know. So to me, I don't consider Conan the, 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 the child of pastiche because I'm not writing like Howard. I'm writing his character and the spirit of his character, keeping right. true to his character. But I'm not writing in, 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 his style, in his style of prose. Steve, on the other hand, that's just how he, he, people are like, yeah, this is a pastiche. He wrote just like he writes just like Howard. I said, no, no. If you read some of his other fantasies, that's just how Steve writes. Well, it was interesting how Steve came on board the uh, the project. We were looking around at a variety of authors, and one of the authors I had wanted to uh, talk to was uh, Steve Sterling. So I was at Dragon Con a couple of years ago, and uh, I ran into him in the hall. And I said, hey, what are you doing for lunch? I want to talk to you about something. And um, he and I sat down in the uh, lobby of the Hyatt uh, where so many of these things happen. Yes. Uh, the hell, that's where um, that's the I got the bar. What's that? <laughs> that's the, that's the, the unofficial author's bar. That one uh -huh. and, and the one in the, uh, the, the and the one in the Westin. Oh, no, no, no. I'm in the Westin, not the Hyatt, yeah. the Westin. No, I was in the Hyatt. And and Steve and I sat down, and we um, and I said, okay, so I'm I'm going to be looking for a new Conan novel, and his eyes lit up, and we started talking about it, and he said, yeah, I remember, uh, oh, and I and and I told him my favorite Conan story was Beyond the Black River. That's that's mine. Mm -hmm. That's the best. Um, without a doubt. Um, yeah. I even own a page of Vucema art from that uh, Savage Sword of Conan. 
Nice. Oh, wow. But, uh, but the thing is that I, I love Beyond the Black River. Love it by Howard. And Steve looked at me and said, yeah, that has one of the best first lines of any of Howard's stories. And immediately I knew that this is someone I needed to talk to because there aren't a lot of people I would know who would immediately be able to call up the first line of my favorite Howard story. I know I can't. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's how we continued. But the, the goal of that book to a degree was to reintroduce the modern audiences to Conan because as you said earlier, one of the problems we've got is that a tremendous number of the modern readers know Conan only through the movies yeah. and the uh, and the comics. They do so, not know the Howard material or any of the pastiches. They only know the, the other media. So was was Sterling? Did he pitch the the Red Nails prelude, or was there guidance given that maybe this is you know a way to approach it? I mean, I think it was great. It really built out you know the high boring age, and it was it was a great strategy to just have it just lead into Red Nails as like denouement. Um, did he pitch that, or was was there was there editorial you know suggestion that that's maybe the attack you no. take? That was one of his pitches. Okay. And uh, working with the Heroic Signatures folks, we uh, chose that as the one that we wanted to go with. And it was funny because we got the manuscript in and I was meeting with someone from Heroic Signatures and realized that um, we actually had the ability to then include in the book uh, the Howard story that was the source of it all. And so readers uh, readers may think that it was there it was there all along it was actually us giving the readers something for free yeah that was a nice touch that was great yeah oh man i i said when i when i was at the, uh, um we were uh, me and steve and steve sterling were on the 90th anniversary uh conan 90th anniversary panel at dragon con two years ago and i sit down there and i put in for that panel because you know i was uh, you know i just love conan and surprisingly enough they chose me so i'm sitting there bet between these two those two men who combine know everything there is to know about conan ever ever and i'm like going oh hell why did i do this <laughs> thanks for watching liking and subscribing join me for part four of a conversation with conan's compatriots steve saffle and brian d anderson and until next time take it easy you stitching dogs